name is Nikki Christensen, and I've been in the industry now for about 19 years, working as a study coordinator in, at a university, then moving into industry with a very large pharmaceutical company as a CRA. And then from that point, working in regulatory, doing some auditing, actually quite a bit of auditing in the last five years, doing quite a bit of project management probably the last six or seven years, and then also doing quite a bit of instructional design and education based on these real-world situations. So when I present, I try to present from the perspective of what works globally. So when we go through our case studies, there's always what ifs, or there's always a sense of, well, we don't have all of the details. But we really need to approach things in terms of what is the intent of the regulations. How do we actually apply good clinical practices? Because we don't have a rule in writing for everything that happens and every situation that comes up. So it's really understanding best approaches and best practices. One of the things we're going to be talking about quite a bit today is root cause analysis and CAPA, Corrective and Preventative Actions. And I'm not going to be talking about that in a formal situation in terms of we must have a quality assurance CAPA plan. But I want to think about this in terms of our day-to-day -day approach. How do we change our behaviors? How do we ensure that we're thinking through things, that our sites are thinking through things, that whether we're a manager or a CRA or a regulatory specialist or a nurse, how do we approach things when they come up? So our objectives for today is to apply our understanding of the GCP standards most critical to core clinical research job functions, to explain the role of quality systems in the GCP environment. So again, not really talking about the regulations say this and the regulations say that, but how do we actually apply these things? What does that mean? apply good clinical practices through critical thinking in the context of real-world clinical research scenarios and simulations, and to explain the concepts of root cause analysis and corrective and preventative action plans to improve site and sponsor performance and compliance. And again, really emphasizing this from how do we apply this every day? not taking a step back and saying, oh, we need to do our formal plan and it looks like this and we need to pull out our SOPs and our templates. But every time something comes up, how do we know that we are applying the correct action? Not corrective, but the correct action based on why something actually happened. And that's really what I hope you do take away from this as we go through our examples. So the foundation. So, of course, we have to start with a base of why we do things, the Declaration of Helsinki, the Nuremberg Code, and the ethical principles behind why we focus so much on what really can be looked at as minutia from those of us who, or for you know, people who are outside of the industry or for people who don't really understand why we have to check every box, why we have to have CVs that are current, why we need to know more about each person's individual background and experience and training when they work on a trial. Because it goes back to, again, all of the atrocities that were committed before things were really formalized in writing and the fact that even though people were physicians, they still committed these atrocities in the name of research, not just in World War II, but even here in the U.S. with Tuskegee, Alabama, and the African-American airmen who were in a government study for research, just to see the course of syphilis. Logically, today, I think hopefully we would sit there and say, well, that's not very ethical. There's no way we would do that. But it wasn't that long ago. And this is really the ethical principles that we have to build upon as we consider how we consent patients, why we're so stringent about that process, why we're so concerned as we move into this electronic environment with electronic signatures on informed consent why we're so worried about verifying that the patient still was able to read the whole document. In this day and age with technology, where we're so used to just scrolling through things on a smartphone and clicking the button, I agree, without reading it word for word, why this becomes a concern when we hand a patient electronic conformed consent to do on their smartphone or on a screen, or when we do electronic charting and there's no place to write those extra progress notes. 
So that's what we really have to think about in terms of how does this move forward now applying the regulations. Ethically, we have to consider the implications. And then we start to look at what is the global approach to this. And we're really going to focus, of course, on E6, good clinical practices, not as the final law that's applied internationally, but as the foundation for how we start to apply some of these ethical principles in writing and a foundation that we can use. 